Berkeley Buddhist Monastery, and we're delighted to have you here. Uh, we're going to be, the class is going until 5, so 3.30 to 5, and the men's and women's facilities are just down the hall to the left. The uh, so is Hong Shu, I'm one of the, the residents here, and we also have Jin Chuan and Jin Wei, two other monks in monastery. So for those of you who are brand new, this is a, a monastery of the, the Chinese Mahayana tradition. We've been here since 1995, and one of the features that we uh, are proud of in years back was a storytelling circle, we call it, and Brian Conroy was the, the uh, teacher and uh, facilitator of the storytelling circle, and it uh, uh, met for a cheap, was, was it nine months or? How long did it go here? A year? I think it was 10 years. 10 years. It was 10 years. <laughs> it just seemed like that. It just passed so quickly. 10 years, storytelling circle. And graduates and people went on from that education into certainly the private sector, but into school teaching, into relationship building, into uh, storytelling, into preaching and such. So this act of storytelling is one of the primary uh, functions of humanity is passing on experience. Brian is uh, the, uh, there's, there is something in North America, I don't know if people know worldwide, certainly, but in North America there is storytelling as a phenomenon, as a discipline itself, different from acting, different from theater, different from uh, just kind of narration. It's its own discipline, its own genre. And storytellers get nationally ranked, and there's a national, uh, uh, association in Jonesville, 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 Jonesville Jonesboro, Tennessee, Jonesboro. and in, uh, in the America South, and there are regional storytelling groups in the Bay Area that has had its own for years. But Brian is one of those storytellers who is nationally ranked and recognized uh, for decades now, and he himself was the convener of the Sierra Story Circle uh, in uh, Meta North California, so he knows everyone. And everyone knows Brian. But he, uh, his day job, along with being a storytelling, uh, you know, a, a, an artist in a storytelling circle, is he was a uh, middle school teacher for decades down in, in uh, southern Silicon Valley. And uh, his lucky students got to perform in plays that he wrote, as well as learning public speaking learning storytelling, learning drama, theater, uh, songwriting, etc. So Brian has uh, all of those credentials under his belt, as well as being San Jose State's, uh, was that the folklore department? Uh, theater department. Theater department. You were the student of, who was the, the professor who was so well? Uh, Bob Jenkins. Bob Jenkins, mm -hmm. who was one of America's most respected and revered storytellers. Brian was his man, since his Chinese calling him the Yi Man you know, the his, his, his uh, student of, of note and carried on the class for some years. So he also has mounted one man uh, comedy monologue uh, plays on vegan eating, among other things. <laughs> and uh, Brian is a, uh, has been to Barcelona, Spain at the Parliament of the World's Religions, where he taught storytelling. And he is also a uh, Buddhist disciple, having taken refuge in 1980-something. 94. 94. <laughs> 94. Uh, disciple of Master Shen Kwan. So he knows his way around the Buddhist world. So with that in mind, uh, Jin Chuan what was, uh, Jin Chuan Shu was one of the, uh, the, the one who said, hey, you know, we've got this uh, family camp here in Northern California. And uh, we wanted to make the theme of our family, Buddhist family camp reconnecting to our roots. And so Brian uh, was the name that popped up immediately as the person who should move forward. Well, that camp has then uh, morphed into the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery. We have two classes. Storytelling class. class. Courses. Or, 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 or. Yeah, so, so that's that's what. Uh, what I wanted to say. Okay, Brian Conway. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Amitofo. 
<laughs> it's really wonderful to be here. I think it's been 12 years since I taught this class, and uh, it's been a long time. I think as I aged, I got less uh, enamored of driving at night and uh, going back on 880 at, uh, you know, after the Saturday lecture. And so I've been away a little bit too long, but you, you know. That's right, that's right. I have a chauffeur right here. <laughs> so um, let's keep this thing going. I think we have some potential to get something started again, kind of rekindle this idea of storytelling. Uh, you know, the beautiful thing about Buddhism and storytelling is they're, they're one and the same. Um, we come from a tradition in which uh, Buddhism has always been taught through storytelling. Uh, Buddha, uh, the Buddha taught the Dharma through storytelling. Our teacher, Master Hua, taught the Dharma through storytelling um, in all of the uh, sutra lectures he gave, in all of the Dharma talks that he gave, um, all kinds of stories. Those stories are still in print, and maybe we can get some of those uh, out of the text and bring them back to life. He has a wonderful uh, body of stories. Um, Buddhism has this wonderful tradition of the Jataka tales, and the Jataka tales are the stories of the Buddha's past lives. And um, each one of the Jataka tales starts with a frame in which usually the Buddha is speaking to Ananda and saying, Ananda says, you know, uh, Master, um, people can sure be greedy in this world. And he says, yes, Ananda. In fact, I remember one time there was a monkey and a tiger. And then he tells the story of the monkey and the tiger. And all, always in the end, he says, and at that time, I was the monkey, and Brahmadatta, who is always the bad guy in all the tales, he says, and the tiger was Brahmadatta. Therefore, we should learn, and there's a little text, a little uh, four-line couplet, usually at the end of each of these Jataka tales, that says, in the future, we must remember that da 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 is a poison, greed is a poison, da 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 da. If we da da da, then we're, you know, like that. And so it <clears throat> formalizes the moral. Uh, at the end of the story. Um, and then, of course, there's all of the um, uh, stories that come from the folklore of China, of Thailand, of Korea, of Vietnam, of Cambodia, of Burma, of uh, Japan. And then there's just the stories from all of the wisdom traditions and all of the religious traditions, um, not necessarily Buddhist, but there's a lot of uh, great Christian stories, there's a lot of great Jewish stories, there's a lot of great uh, Sufi stories and Muslim stories um, that speak to principle. And so it's perfectly acceptable for us to tell those stories. Um, but what if we were, as a group, to create this sort of canon of stories that speak to our practice as Buddhists and speak to who we are as Buddhists and um, get those stories out there, okay? I mean, wouldn't that be wonderful? And there's also, of course, the stories of our families, of our grandparents, our parents, um, our ancestors long ago, and then just start the stories of our own personal lives, the things we've experienced that we may not perceive to be um, stories that have to do with uh, Buddhist practice or Buddhist cultivation, but nonetheless, they tell us who we are, they inform us of who we are, and then help us as we go through our lives, okay? So um, we're going to meet four times and hopefully beyond that. But we'll just focus on these first four sessions for now. And my goals for those um, four sessions would be first for us to understand the power of stories and the practical uses of stories, which I'll talk about in just a second. Okay? And then second, that each of you in four weeks, I think that's October 20th, that each of us tells a story all by ourselves in about a month's time for the rest of the group. And we can do it in a seated position, or we can stand up. Um, you know, we'll, we can make that determination later on. Okay? And then uh, another goal is just for us to learn some basic storytelling uh, skills. Um, although, you know, I'm not sure we're going to learn a lot of storytelling skills today. We're going to kind of 
push it in the water, so to speak, and uh, just get started. And then once we get started with a couple of stories, we'll refine uh, a couple of our uh, techniques. And then what I want us to do, our, um, my final goal is that we would build each of us, build individually a repertoire of stories. We already have those stories. We don't realize it. But we're going to kind of put them all together, you know, pull them out, dredge them up, and realize that we already have a small body of stories and then kind of add to those stories. Some of these are going to be personal stories. Some of these are going to be stories from the Buddhist canon of stories, if you will. Some might come from the sutras. Some might come from Master Wa. Some might come from your own particular um, ethnic tradition or you know, your, the, your country of origin. And you know, put together a little body of stories that each of us uh, has that we can hold on to. Okay? So what, what good are stories? What are, what are the uses of stories? Okay? So um, first of all, each of us, in order to understand what we're doing, what we're here for, you know, not here in this particular class, but why we're on the earth, you know, our purpose in life, you know, um, and to move on and to bring some benefit to this world and to bring some benefit to others, um, there are stories that help in that. And so just to kind of collect those stories that mean something to us, I have several stories that I don't really tell. They're not stories that I would perform or I would even get out to other people, but they mean something to me, and I hold them in my mind, OK? So there's this one story um, about uh, this. There's a small village in India. And every morning, these people in this small village, they get up and they sing until the sun comes up. Now, people make fun of these people. But these people are so unsophisticated, they don't understand the science of the rising and the setting of the sun. But these people say that for the thousands of years that these people have gotten up every morning and sung the sun up, it has never once failed to rise into the sun, into the sky. You know? So what if it's you? What if you're the one that makes that sun rise, you know? So that story just means something to me. I don't think I've ever told it before, you know? Then there's a story about um, Gandhi. This mother brings her child to go see Gandhi, and she waits in line for just hours and hours until finally she gets an audience with Gandhi. And she says to Gandhi, my son thinks only about chocolate. That's all he thinks about. He eats it all day long. Please tell my son to stop eating chocolate. And Gandhi says, come back in three days. She comes back in three days. She waits in line for hours and hours and finally gets an audience with Gandhi. And Gandhi looks at the little boy and says, stop eating chocolate. And the mother says, why did you have to wait three days to tell him that? And Gandhi says, three days ago, I had not stopped eating chocolate myself. <laughs> so you know, we teach by practical example. And if you're not a model of what you teach to your children or what you teach to your students, then you know, the lesson's maybe only half as important. Of course, storytelling can be used in teaching. Yu Chen, where are you? Where did you go? OK, there you are, OK? So you know, maybe we're going to find a way to use stories in order to teach content, OK? Yeah. And in raising our children, we're going to use storytelling. We're going to use it to pass on values, to teach morals, to teach etiquette, OK? Um, to uh, illustrate examples of you know, how we live our lives, and also to teach family history. You know, uh, to teach about our ancestors, grandparents, some of whom are still with us, some of whom have passed away, some of whom are in the old country, let's say. Um, and then, of course, in um, speaking the Dharma, you know, um, we saw uh, Jin Wei Shur um, talk uh, at lunch today, those of us that were at lunch, um, about, you know, going to medical school and the prescription and uh, uh, being not only a doctor, but a patient. And you, know, you can think of it as an allegory, but it was storytelling. And that really worked for many of us to have that example. It was a metaphor. It was a symbol, um, something to latch on to. Um, 
in the, in the many uh, Saturday evening lectures, the times that I've, excuse me, connected the most are when Dharma Master Sure is um, telling about the Three Steps, One Bow pilgrimage or giving his own personal uh, stories of growing up in Toledo. And you know that's when I really connect with the Dharma. I was drawn specifically to this form of Buddhism because I thought it was practical, because it was all about the, the five precepts. And it was you know, real ways, you know, the six perfections and the ways of perfecting your conduct and making yourself a better human being. You know? And it's those stories that make, that bring it down to our level, you know? It's not quite so esoteric. It's like, oh, here's what I can do to, to perfect my character, to become a better human being, okay? Um, and then, you know, we tell stories to entertain. We tell stories to kind of lighten people up, to cheer people up. Um, you know, you could think of that in the same light as relieving someone's suffering. Um, you know, we think of entertainment somehow as trivial, and most of the time it is. If you turn on television, it's pretty trivial and pretty insignificant. But to tell a story that has maybe some, some humor in, in it, but also a little bit of wisdom, um, there's some power there. Um, my mom was a person that uh, used humor to its absolute best effect. She could walk into a room and lighten the mood just by a, a simple comment. She could see tension. She could kind of read it, you know? And she would say some little sort of flip remark that could just lighten everybody up. And everybody goes, oh, yeah, gee, we're being a little too serious about this thing. You're right, you know what I mean? We better all just lighten up, you know what I mean? Hey, we're all here. We're family. You know, let's all get along, you know? And she just sort of infused love into a room through using humor, you know? And so it's worked for me, because that's, <laughs> that's, that's sort of, uh, that's one of my roots, at least, you know? Um, now, in order to do, uh, in order to learn storytelling, we have to learn by doing. So I'm going to ask all of us to participate, and we're going to start that in just about five or six minutes. Um, we're going to do things that probably haven't been done in the Buddha Hall uh, before, and I apologize. I mean, no uh, disrespect, but you know, I think this is the first time balloons have ever, ever been in the, <laughs> the Buddha Hall. So we're going to have a little bit of fun. Um, today what I want to do is uh, maybe spend 10 minutes just getting to know each other and kind of working together as a group. Uh, then um, I want us to tell a story. And we're all going to tell the same story. I promise no one will have to be in front of the whole group to tell that story. It'll all be in partners, OK? Um, and then uh, we're going to do a little bit. I'm going to hand out some stories uh, that you'll learn. And this will be the one that you tell in about a month's time, okay? And you can also choose your own. It doesn't have to be the ones that I brought today, okay? Uh, and then we're going to tell some personal stories, because in about three weeks, I want us to uh, develop a personal story, something that happened to us, something that's true, comes from our heart, that connects with our roots, it tells who we are, maybe, um, tells you know, what, you know, what, what we believe in, uh, what we're doing in the world, and that kind of thing, okay? But I want to just start a little tradition, if you don't mind. And OK. So um, I'm going to light this little candle here. And we'll try to do this each time. See if I can avoid. So um, there's a reggae song that I like. Called by the rivers of Babylon, and in it it says, uh, "May the words of our mouths and the uh, meditations of our hearts." And then I'll add on the last line. So I'm going to say this when I light the candle: "May the words of our hearts, and the, may the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts honor the stories that we tell today." And we'll keep this lit. throughout our little storytelling circle, OK? Is that all right? I'm going to tell a Native American story before we get started. When the world was made, the gods went to all the living things and said, what do you want to be? And what do you want to be? And what do you want to be? Some said, we want to fly with grace in the blueness 
of the skies. For God said, we will make you into birds, all kinds of birds, big birds, little birds, all kinds of birds. Some said, we want to swim with grace in the coolness of the waters. But God said, we will make you into fish, all kinds of fish, big fish and little fish, all kinds of fish. The rivers and the lakes and the seas shall be your home, and you shall swim in them forever. And some said, we want to move with grace upon the land. We want to climb mountains and run through the valleys. We want to lie down and sleep in the forest at night. But God said, we will make you into animals, all kinds of animals, big animals, little animals, all kinds of animals. The mountains and the valleys and the forest shall be your homes, and you shall move through them forever. And some said, we want to live with the grace of gods in the world. We want to live in peace and harmony with all living things. For God said, we will make you into human beings, all kinds of human beings, some big, some small, all kinds of human beings. This world shall be your home, and you shall live in it forever. And thus it was that all the living things chose the forms that they would take and the kinds of lives that they would lead. Now, at that time, all living things spoke the same language. And because they shared and understood the same language, they were all friends. And each day there was talking and laughing and singing and dancing. And they all drank from the same cool, pure springs that bubbled up out of Mother Earth. And they ate the same grasses and roots, fruits and berries that also came from Mother Earth. And every day they gathered together at the great council of living things to speak their hearts. But one day, one day, Coyote did not go to the great council of living things. He stayed in the brush thinking, I'm tired of company. I'm tired of grass and roots. I'm hungry for something else. And while he lay there thinking these thoughts, sleep fell upon him. And as he slept in the warm sunshine, the spirit Unaput came and put fresh red flesh under his nose saying, it's good. It's very good. Taste it. It's good. Coyote woke slowly. Mmm, meat, meat. It smells good. Oh, it is good. Taste it. And when Coyote ate that meat, he said, I will never eat grass again. <laughs> Just then, a brown cottontail rabbit came bounding across an open field, a leap, a tear, teeth sinking into flesh. And Coyote had made the first kill. No longer did he go to the meetings of the great council. He stayed in the brush among the manzanita thickets. Well, at first, the smaller animals, when they met Coyote, they continued to greet him in friendship, as had always been the way. But now, lust and greed were in the world. And Coyote would pounce on them and kill them and eat them. So before long, the smaller animals, they would not speak with Coyote. They would not go near him, because now fear was in the hearts of living things. And that fear was of another living thing. Quail, mice, rabbits, they no longer went to the meetings of the great council. They stayed in their dens and their nests and their burrows. The sparrows, the juncos, the bluebirds, they stayed high in the branches of the pines and the oaks and the cedars. And the smaller animals grew ever more fearful as each day passed. 
Well, the larger animals like ourselves, we sat alone at the meetings of the Great Council wondering what had happened in the world. Coyote had been our friend, one of them said. Now he kills all those weaker than himself. Yes, said another, it could happen to us all. We can no longer trust each other. We can only trust ourselves. We must change our ways and our customs, and then we will be safe. Yes, said another, we, we must change our signs and our language and stay only to ourselves. And so it was that skunks began to speak only with other skunks. Squirrels spoke only with other squirrels. Salmon spoke only with other salmon. Ravens spoke only with ravens. Raccoons spoke only with raccoons. Bears spoke only with bears. Deer only with other deer. And tribes of human beings spoke only to their tribe of human beings. No more talking and laughing and singing and dancing. No more meetings of the great council of living things to speak our hearts. Well, a few seasons passed, and that language we once shared with all living things was forgotten. And so it is today we find it so difficult to speak with our sisters and brothers, but we still have our poems and our prayers and our songs and our stories. And it is with these that we can still speak with our hearts to one another. I want to tell a story. It's a real brief story and a real easy one to learn. And then I'm going to have you folks retell this very same story. And as we do this, we're going to talk about, you know, what what's necessary in a story, uh, what are the essential elements of this particular story, how you can embellish a story, you know, what you can't embellish, and things like that, okay? So once a long time ago, in a small village, there was this tailor, and he made the most beautiful overcoats anyone has ever seen, the most colorful overcoats that anyone has ever seen. Now, he was a poor man, and he sold his overcoats for a very reasonable price, and so he never made himself an overcoat. But what he did is he saved bits of material, and scraps of fabric, and pieces of yarn, and thread, and when he had enough material and enough thread and yarn, he stitched all those pieces together into a beautiful overcoat. Oh, he loved that overcoat. He was so proud of that overcoat. He wore it everywhere he went. He wore it, and he wore it, and he wore it until he wore it all out. Hmm. At least he thought he wore it out, but when he looked carefully, he found there was enough material left in the overcoat to make himself a jacket. So he took all the remaining material and he stitched it all together and he made himself a beautiful jacket. Oh, he loved that jacket. He was so proud of that jacket. He wore it everywhere he went. He wore it and he wore it and he wore it until he wore it all out. At least he thought he wore it out, but when he looked carefully, he saw there was enough material left in that jacket to make himself a shirt. So he stitched all the remaining material together. He made himself a beautiful, colorful shirt. Oh, he loved that shirt. He was so proud of that shirt. He wore it everywhere he went. He wore it, and he wore it, and he wore it until he wore it all out. <laughs> Well, at least he thought he wore it out. But when he looked carefully, he saw there was enough material left in that shirt to make a uh, vest. A vest. <laughs> oh, man, he made the most beautiful vest. He loved that vest. He was so proud of that vest. He wore it everywhere he went. He wore it, and he wore it, and he wore it until, you know what happened? He wore it all out. You heard the story before? Yeah. Oh, OK, that's good. He wore it all out. At least he thought he wore it out. But when he looked carefully, he saw there was enough material left in that vest to make a, 
a handkerchief. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he stitched all the material together. The most beautiful handkerchief. Oh, he loved that handkerchief. <laughs> he was so proud of that handkerchief. He wore. He took it with him everywhere he went. <laughs> he used it and he used it and he used it until he used it all up. At least he thought he used it up. But when he looked carefully, he saw there was enough material left in that handkerchief to make himself a button. Oh, he loved that button. Oh, you were so proud of that button. He wore it everywhere he went. He wore it and he wore it and he wore it until he wore it out. And, well, at least he thought he wore it out. But when he looked carefully, he saw there was enough material left in that button to make a story. And the story he made out of that button is the story I just told you. <laughs> All right, now, so here's what we're going to do. Stories can be modified, and stories are modified as part of the oral tradition. Stories keep changing as they're handed down from generation to generation, from grandmother to mother to daughter. They keep changing, and they fit a new context and a new generation. Okay? So we can tell this story any way we want. We can set it in any village we want. We can change the gender of the tailor. We can change what he makes. It's just that it goes from one thing to another, to another, to another. And we probably should end up with, and he creates the story out of it at the very end. So what's essential in this story? What do we have to know in order to tell this story? First thing he's making? <laughs> okay, his occupation. Okay, so we need to know probably he's a tailor, and you know, you could even modify it beyond that. I would probably recommend on our first, since we're all going to tell this, uh, probably stick fairly close to, to the storyline. Okay, so it's a tailor. He makes some stuff. Okay, and what does he make first? You want to stick with an overcoat? That's good. Okay, and then, you know. So I think we said an overcoat. A jacket, a shirt, no, we go to vest. vest. Okay, an overcoat, a jacket, a vest, a handkerchief, a button, a story. Okay. What do we need to know about? Do we need any, you know, so let's think about time, place, characters. Okay. What, what time did this take place? I didn't say. It doesn't matter. Exactly. I didn't really say. But you can if you want. You know, long, long ago in, okay, okay. Where did it take place? India. Right? Okay, you can say India. Absolutely. What did you say? We don't really know. I mean, I think I. See, I may have said a village, you know, but if you want to personalize it, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, you can bring some little uh, contemporary humor to it. Sure, by all means. Okay. You want to say it's a village in China? Fantastic. You know, you want to say it's a small village called Berkeley, that's great. You know, or wherever you want to set it. Does that compromise the integrity of the story? No. Yeah, I would say not. You know, it just sort of enlivens it. You know, makes it more relevant maybe for the audience. And you go, well, these people will probably enjoy having, you know, saying Berkeley because they know Berkeley and they've been to Berkeley, they live in Berkeley. Okay, so that's good. Okay. So what else? Now, I could give you the written text of it, which I have, but I don't want to give you the written text of it because I don't want you to learn it word for word and memorize it. Stories aren't good when you learn them word for word. Yeah, there are some stories you want to, rec you want to uh, learn verbatim. You know, when I told that story about the language that was lost and you know, the very first story, I would say that most of that is fairly set and I am kind of saying it verbatim because there's a lot of poetry from the original Native American language that I want to retain, okay? But on this, you know, it's going to be our own poetry. We're going to put our own sort of touches onto this. So let's go through it in our minds, okay? There's this tailor. A seamstress. A seamstress, okay, that's great, <laughs> absolutely. Lives in a village, who knows where, it can be anywhere you want to set it. Okay. Makes, makes overcoats, they're beautiful, they're colorful, they're made out of a lot of different scraps, you know, pieces of fabric, material, leftover pieces of yarn, thread, etc. You know, sort of quilts it together, yeah? Okay. 
but he's a, you know, he's a poor man. He doesn't have a lot of extra material. He's always worrying about making these overcoats for other people, sells them for a reasonable price. You know, he doesn't make a lot of money off of them. But eventually, he saves enough material, and he makes his own overcoat, okay? Or whatever you want to make, a dress, okay? You know, a formal gown, okay? And then we go to, to smaller garment after that, okay? Then it goes from one large garment to a smaller, to a smaller, to a smaller. You know, at the end, I mean, I say button, but I mean, it could be a sock, it could be a scarf, uh, you know, a hat. So anything you want until just at the end, and maybe we should memorize this uh, sentence or phrase, um, and, the, and he made a story, and at least he thought he made, uh, wore it out, but when he looked carefully, he saw there was enough material left in that button to make a story. And the story he made out of the button is the story that I just told you. And then there were a lot of repetitive things that we did. So I said, um, he loved that coat. He made, the, he made the coat. He loved that coat. Oh, he's so proud of that coat. He wore it, and he wore it, and he wore it until he wore it all up. At least he thought he wore it, up, wore it out. But when he looked carefully, he saw there was enough material. So let's just sort of say that all together. You ready? Oh, he loved that coat. He was so proud of that coat. He wore it, and he wore it, and he wore it until he wore it all out. At least he thought he wore it out. But when he looked carefully, he saw there was enough material left in that coat to make. Do that one more time, or do it one more time? Oh, he loved that coat. He was so proud of that coat. He wore it, and he wore it, and he wore it until he wore it all out. At least he thought he wore it out. But when he looked carefully, he saw there was enough material left in that coat to make a vest. No, a shirt. A shirt. A blanket. A blanket. That's it. OK. <laughs> so here's what I'm going to ask you to do. And I want to do a couple of rounds of this if we can. So uh, we're going to tell this story to our partner. And as soon as you're done, why don't you just have your partner tell the very same story, her version of the very same story. It does not have to match yours at all. She's going to tell her version of the story then to you. And when both of you are done, just so I can get a sense of you know, when we're done, why don't, when both of you are done telling your story, why don't you raise your hand so I can go, OK, good. We still have four or five more here. And, and then I know when we go on to the next activity. Yeah, small rug. OK, everybody's good? Everyone has a partner? OK, we're all going to make a little bit of noise. So, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I should say this. OK, so here's what we want to do. Um, see if you can get fairly close to your partner. Like, these two women right here are almost perfect. You know, they're maybe about a foot apart. I want you to sit up a little bit straight. We want to be as attentive to our partners as possible. I want you to look at your partner. Don't get distracted. Look out the window. Try to make good eye contact with your partner. Partners, you can give some sort of pleasant facial expressions. I know you're thinking about, oh, how am I going to tell my story? And you know, a little distracted till yours comes up. But try to you know, stay focused on them the entire time. Give a pleasant facial expression. That feeds them some positive energy, yeah? OK? And we're not going to really try to theatricalize anything quite yet. We're just going to tell the story, OK? Just sort of get into it. Everybody's good? And this is perfect, right here. These are my model students, right here. <laughs> job, bye. OK, ready? And go. Good job. Everyone looked engaged. It looked like we had some very creative versions uh, of the stories. And um, before we go on to the next activity, we ran out of time quickly, didn't we? That's good. Time went quickly. But that's OK. We're going to keep doing this. So um, Van had a very interesting question. You know? So I encouraged everybody to modify the story, make it your own. And, um, and I want to encourage us to keep doing this. We're starting with a very you know, simple story that probably doesn't have much dharma in it at all. You know? I mean, maybe you could come up with recycling or being <laughs> resourceful or whatever. I'm not sure, but probably not. <laughs> Um, and yet, 
um, then, being a good Buddhist, it says, well, where is the line of false speech, okay? And so um, may I introduce you to the Reverend Hung Shur to address this, <laughs> to address this concern. So what is, what is fiction? Fiction is a tour through the mind of the author. A really good book, your favorite book, you know, Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, Wind in the Willows, uh, they have maybe some basis back, but they're creative acts. Storytelling is a creative act. So can you harm somebody by creating a story that's entirely imagination? Look at your intention. Sure you can. You can mislead people. I think if you think about the, the, those people who are familiar with the Buddhist version of ten good and ten evil deeds, know there are four ways to create evil with your mouth, with speech. And one of them is outright lies, one is schism-making or gossip, one is harsh speech, and the fourth one is really the one that this, this remains with us, which is frivolous speech. Frivolous speech divides into two. One is prattle. Just blah 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 in Chinese. But the other one is words that lead the mind into harmful paths. So dirty jokes, for example. Mm. Okay, what's the intention is the question to ask that cuts through all of that. And the sutras then go on to say, oh my goodness, here's the good that you do with your voice, with your words. And it goes on to talk about how a bodhisattva speaks to ennoble to guide, to comfort, to bless, to instruct, to, to uh, encourage, you know, to delight, joy, all is good. With the Lord. So it's, if, if I had to think as I was telling the story, oh my goodness, I better be careful because that's not true, mm -hmm. the story was flat and it's no fun. And you've lost your opportunity to, to give. So what I do is I think, what's my intention? If my story is entirely factual and instructions and I'm passing on something that I was told, then you better be true, right? But if I'm coming up with a story about a tailor who loved his coat, his overcoat, that's totally in the realm of imagination. So uh, that's not a place to exercise those standards and say, you know, oh my goodness, well, I never met the tailor. I, this, is a, this is a lie. <laughs> if you're in the wrong class, right? <laughs> so the um, this is a pretty place to use this method called the six pattern. And if my story that I'm telling is meant to be contentious, to show myself better than someone and to put you down, that will be due affliction. And you can do it. There's nothing. No gold lightnings that come out of the ceiling, but it will lead to affliction. It won't lead to, to mutual benefit, to, to joy, to connection. Two, if my story is full of greed, you know, and I want you to think better of me, I'm greedy for your wholesome opinion of me, you know, I want you to like me. That's my name personally, I'm sure you boy guy. So that is going to lead to a fish. If you're seeking something in as part of your story's purpose, your motive, then you've left the, the act of storytelling behind, you're engaging in desire, you know, desire for a, a, a reputation as a great storyteller. So you tarnish your story, you know, it's no longer true. So then there's selfishness, self-benefit, and then dishonesty. So I ask myself those questions, and if the answer is no, it's not. I'm engaging in storytelling, I'm learning, I'm having fun with friends. Tell your story and enjoy it. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, so this question might be to Andrew, but what about the concept of white lies? Because the intention is good, and it is a lie. Yes, I think uh, you're right. Good question. That's not pertinent for our story. Okay. We can talk about that, you know, in the world. Your kids, for example. The Buddha told the white lie when a kid was crawling towards, the, you know, the superhighway. He said, Buddha's crawling towards 980. 
And the Buddha says, I got a, you know, an iPad here, you know. <laughs> and he goes, iPad? He turns around and comes back, and the Buddha doesn't have an iPad. He's only got a, you know, a tablet with a pencil. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, you know, hey, man, you got it. So, yeah, but he, the Buddha said, I may not have given you the iPad, but I gave you your life. Mm. So I'll take the hit in telling a lie, and I'll give you your life. So that's a white lie. Whether that's... True story, I made it up. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to do a little more storytelling, but I want you to get a different partner. I want each of you to tell this same story, okay? As soon as you're done, your partner just tells the very same type of story, okay? But this is going to be, they're, they're going to be vastly different. I want you to tell a little bit about your grandmother or your grandfather. Okay, or your great grandmother or your great grandfather. If you don't have any sort of any living, like you never met any of your grandparents, I'm one of those people that only met one of my four grandparents in my entire life. How do you like that? Mm. So, I, but I can still tell about my grandmother on my mom's side. Okay, so um, but so a grandparent, grandmother, grandfather, Great grandfather, great grandmother. If you don't have any of those, tell about your mom or your dad, okay? But I want you to tell who they were, okay? What they believed in, what they stood for, what they tried to teach you. Some sort of story that illustrates who they were, okay? The impact they had on your life, the influence they made on you as a person and your character, okay? Now I want you to keep this fairly short, okay? So I think what I'll do is just to keep things moving a little bit, at around two minutes, I'm gonna say, other person, start your story pretty soon, okay? So I'll go about two minutes each person. Is that okay? Yeah. Ready? And first person, go. Okay, great. Um, we don't have a whole lot of time to sort of debrief and talk a little bit about, you know, what happened. And I want to use these last three minutes to just do one more, okay? How about, let's stay with the same partner so we don't even take the time to move to a new, new person. But how about someone who inspires you or someone who inspired you, okay? Could be a teacher you had, a coach, a parent, a friend. Somebody that just sort of brought out the best in you, maybe had a lot of faith in you. Um, uh, you know, really stood behind you and uh, showed you they cared about you, you know, br really brought the love to you and, uh, in your life somewhere, okay? A person that inspires you now or inspired you in the past, okay? And um, we're going to have to keep this a little short, so we'll go about maybe a minute and a half on each person, okay? First person, go ahead and start. I think we are at the start of something really special. I think we uh, had a great session today, and I'm looking forward to these next uh, three weeks. If you can come next week with a story, and maybe come with the text of the story, um, and we'll start working on it, okay? So we're gonna maybe look at the text and see you know, some certain things we might isolate and talk about uh, emphasis and uh, inciting action and things like that, okay? Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.